All right, Academic Astronomy, welcome back. Mr. Krug coming at you here on our last day of Christmas vacation would be the 10th of the 12 days of Christmas, so still two days of Christmas remaining. And today, everybody, we're going to be talking about our wintertime sky on our SC01 and our SC01T constellation charts. So your winter sky, everybody, is probably the most intense sky we put here on the equatorial star charts. On the O1, it's actually pretty easy. This is all that you need. But then we're going to see in a little bit on the O1T, it gets pretty intense. So let's start our way through it here. Step number one, everybody, just trace over the constellations on the full O1 chart. Looks like we have eight constellations total. And just make sure you're using a different color than you did on previous seasons. Now, my chart I've actually used from a previous year when we were virtual last spring. So I already have my spring sky drawn in, but I don't have my summer. You at home, if you've been following along, you should already have your summer sky traced in, your fall, and now your winter sky will be right here. So make sure you use a different color. So dominating the wintertime sky with his belt of three stars, we have o Orion, the mighty hunter. Make sure you do include his club arm and his shield right there. And even though his real mortal enemy, according to the Greeks, is Scorpius the scorpion lurking low here in winter, on our winter sky, he appears to be battling Taurus, the mighty bull. We learned about this constellation during Origins of Astronomy. I like to think of Taurus as the oldest constellation on Earth. We first see it almost 17,000 years ago, sketched on some cave walls in Lasso, France. Then right here, everybody, unofficially connected to the top horn, we have Oraja, the charioteer. This would have been the person driving the chariot back during the days of Roman gladiators while they fought on the back. Now, the tricky thing, everybody, just like we saw in the fall with Pegasus and Andromeda, these stick figures are unofficially connected at the top horn of the bull. And remember, I say unofficially connected because in reality, constellations are whole big pieces of property on the night sky. So it's actually impossible for a star to be a part of both constellations. But because the stick figures are unofficial, we'll say they're connected right here. I like to primarily think of Orija as this pentagon on the sky, but you'll notice here on these charts, we also have this point, and don't forget to trace over that line right there. It's tough to see because it's right along the six hour mark of right ascension. So make sure you trace in this portion here. Then coming back down the sky, one of our two constellations of the Zodiac, with Taurus being the other, we have a very famous constellation, Gemini, the twins, with their bright stars, Castor and Pollux. Remember, friends, Gemini and Taurus are both constellations of the Zodiac because they are the two constellations through which are ecliptic. The path the sun takes in the sky throughout the year passes. So everybody, real quick, repeat after me at home. Ecliptic. Lovely. Good job, everybody. All right, then we have Orion the Hunter's two hunting dogs. We have the little dog Canis Minor with the bright star Procyon, and we have the big dog Canis Major with the very bright star Sirius. So just like Ursa Major and Ursa Minor were the big and little bears on our north circumpolar sky, Canis Major and Canis Minor are the big and little dogs. Canis in Latin means dog or tooth. So this is the big dog and the little dog there. And we'll talk more about the very bright star Sirius on our next chart. And both these dogs, everybody, are pursuing their prey of Lepus. Lepus in mythology is an, a hare, an H-A-R-E hare. So that's like a bunny with bigger ears. I just remember most rabbits leap. So we have the hunter, his hunting dogs, and the hare. Finally, one constellation is going to do double duty for us this year because we'll see it again upside down when we get to the south circumpolar sky. We have Eradnus. This in mythology is the river or the river of the dead. So to the Greeks and Romans, everybody, the afterlife wasn't a totally different realm like most of the world's religions think about it today. It was more or less a physical place separated from the realm of the living, by the river Styx. 
And that's what we see here with Eridanus. Way down south, we have the bright star Akronar. But just to understand from our latitude, everybody, we can't actually see down this far. I would say our visual limit where we are here in Pennsylvania is probably right to about there, probably right around negative 40 degrees declination. All right, so get one last look. Here is how your winter sky should look on your O1 chart. All right, let's switch over to the T chart. Now here, everybody, is where things get really legit because there's a crazy amount to add. So step number two, using your same color, looks like I used a bluish purple, you're going to connect all of your constellations, connect all the dots to make them up. Then step three, same color, you're going to write capital letters, not only for the constellation names, but for our two asterisms. Here on the winter sky, everybody, our first one is the winter W. And it's a very handy one because it actually connects five stars in four different constellations. It goes from Procyon down to Sirius, up to Betelgeuse, and down to Raju and Orion. Finally, it ends at the reddish eye of the bull, Aldebaran, in Taurus the bull. Then way up here, this little triangle, this cute little triangle right here, is the kids. So in Araja the charioteer, Capella is actually the mommy goat star. So kids here doesn't mean little children, it means baby goats. We have the mommy goat and her kids. All right, so finally, step four, everybody, is the one time you want to switch colors and we want to put in our stars and objects. Now here, everybody, Orion the Hunter is absolutely loaded. The only other constellation we see this year with this many stars that we have to memorize is Ursa Major, the Great Bear. So here in the shoulders... First up, we have the Armpit of the Mighty One, Betelgeuse. Its name in Arabic means Armpit of the Mighty One because that's about where the hunter's armpit would be. And this, everybody, along with Antares in Scorpius the Scorpion, is a red supergiant star, one of the biggest stars in the entire night sky. The crazy thing about Betelgeuse, astronomers estimate it is right on the verge of supernova. And we could just see it within our lifetimes, Keep in mind, though, at a distance somewhere around 500 light years, we are actually looking back in time 500 years. So Betelgeuse could have actually supernovaed 499 years ago, but we won't know it until the light from that explosion reaches our eyes. The other shoulder star is Bellatrix. Down in the hunter's feet, we have a very bright blue supergiant. Not bigger than Betelgeuse, but many times hotter. This is Rigel. And then winding out this rectangle, we have an Arabic-sounding star, Saif. Now, we do need to know the belt stars. So from left to right, here in academic astronomy, it goes Aun Atak, Aun Alam, and then Mintaka. So there's a number of ways you can label it. I chose to put them over there. So from left to right. Finally, everybody, hanging below the hunter's belt, we have the sword, this is the home of M42, the Orion Nebula, a beautiful stellar nursery where you can see baby stars being born with the naked eye. So there's a whole lot here in Orion. Now, don't focus so much on the hunter that we overlook a number of things to find in the Great Bull of Taurus. First off, we have not one, but two star clusters. The first one, pay good attention because it's not actually listed by name on the O1 chart. This, everybody, is the star cluster, the Hyades. It's this entire V-shaped group. So please put a dotted line around the whole group and then write Hyades. In any other part of the sky, they'd be a really big deal. Unfortunately for them, they happen to be right beside maybe the most famous star cluster on the whole night sky, the Pleiades. Here in America, we call them the Seven Sisters or the Seven Sailor Stars or the Seven Indian Maidens. But the Japanese know this little grouping as Subaru. So if you or your mom or your dad has a Subaru automobile, look at the hood ornament and you can see the Pleiades twinkling in the background. With the naked eye, you can see six or seven stars. A pair of binoculars might reveal 30, and a decent backyard telescope can show over 100 stars in this little cluster. So friends, the Pleiades is very similar to the Hyades, except they're much younger. 
The Hyades is older, and these stars are starting to fly the stellar coop and go their own direction. Now, somewhat confusing, Aldebaran appears to be in the Hyades. It's this bright red giant star here. Technically, though, everybody, Aldebaran is actually much closer to us in outer space than the rest of the Hyades. But because our brains love to make shapes and patterns on the sky due to a phenomenon called paradelia, we tend to consider it part of this V-shaped group, even though it's a lot closer. Finally, everybody, we have scenes of stellar birth on the winter sky like M42, but we also have one scene of stellar death. Right here above the bull's bottom horn, we have M1, the Crab Nebula. This is the X marks the spot where a massive star, kaboom, supernova back around the year 1048 AD. We know it was around 1048 AD because the Chinese, excellent naked eye astronomers in their own right, left detailed records of this explosion. They said it was so bright they could see it during the daytime for six straight months. So such a similar fate lies with Betelgeuse when it explodes someday. Luckily, friends, M41 and Betelgeuse are very, I'm sorry, M1 and Betelgeuse are very, very far away from us. If a massive star did go supernova within 30 light years of us, the burst of energy could tear off our ozone layer and we would be fried. Luckily, everybody, there are no supergiant stars near us on the verge of supernova anytime soon. M1 has since faded from naked eye view. You now need a very good backyard telescope to know exactly where you're looking to see the remains of the crab. Up here in Oraja, sometimes it's so bright I can initially mistake it for Venus when it's rising in the east. This, everybody, is the bright star Capella, the mommy goat star. Working our way back down to Gemini the Twins, we have these two bright twin stars. Castor's the top twin, Pollux is the bottom twin, and then here are their bodies of stars trailing out below them. Finally, back down here to the hunting dogs, Canis Minor, even though there's only two stars we can see with the naked eye, everybody, notice the bottom one does have a proper name. It's very bright. It is called Procyon. The silly way I remember it, I think, this little dog was a very good hunter, not an amateur, but a pro for Procyon. And then finally, everyone, here in the big dog, a star that needs no introduction, the brightest star in our night sky called Sirius. The ancients knew this as the dog star. This is also where the phrase dog days of summer comes from, because the ancient Egyptians would watch for the rising of Sirius in the east right before the sun came up during the hottest months of summer, and they knew that the flooding of the Nile, which was very important to their agriculture, was not far away. So that had a practical meaning, the dog days of summer. Now understand, friends, in terms of apparent magnitude, how the stars appear on our sky, Sirius is by far the brightest star. However, in terms of absolute magnitude, if we moved all these stars to a standard distance, stars like Betelgeuse and Rigel would be far brighter than Sirius. So the reason Sirius is so bright, my friends, is it's only around eight and a half light years away. So even though we're seeing how Betelgeuse looked 500 years ago and Rigel 1,000 years ago, we're really only seeing Sirius about eight years back into the past. So being one of the closest stars to, it, to us makes it appear very bright on the sky. Okay, let's just review very, very quickly. I'm sorry this video got a little long, but the winter sky is very detailed. Step number one, everybody, pick a different color than you used on summer and fall. Trace out your eight constellations of the winter sky. Steps two through four are on your T-chart. Step two, same color, connect the dots to make those same eight constellations. Step three, same color, use capital letters to write their names and also add dotted lines for our asterisms, the winter W and the kids. Finally, everybody, step four, switch colors and write in the star and object names in lowercase letters. 
Okay, you got a lot of work here to do on the winter sky, but I think you're all going to do a fantastic job. For Mr. Krug, we'll catch you next time, everybody. Peace.